Hello, we're almost done. We're almost there. We're almost at the end of the semester. We just got a couple more sections to talk about. And we're going to go through this right now with section 10.2 from your textbook from Susanna Epps, uh, Discrete Mathematics Brief Edition. Uh, just a reminder uh, that uh, due this Friday, if you're watching this video at the time it's posted, due this Friday are revisions on exam number two. If you haven't gotten those in yet, I will take them late. I'll take whatever you got. Um, just make sure you get those in better late than never. I'd love to have them by this Friday at the actual due date. We've got a couple of problem sets coming up and one more exam. I'll make sure that exam number three is posted next week and due sometime during the final exam period. I want to make sure that you have time to work on that exam and uh, so I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to make the final set of problems uh, for sections 10.2 and 10.3 uh, optional ones. But there will be questions uh, pertaining to sections 10.2 and 10.3 on that exam. So we are going to make sure that we address those sections before the semester is up. So we're going to start with section 10.2. Now that we have graph theory under our belts, that was section 10.1, sort of a real crash course, like a 35 minute introduction to graph theory. Uh, graphs, again, being this sort of abstraction of what a network is, whenever you've got uh, vertices connected by various edges, anytime you've got sort of a network structure with objects connected to one another by some sort of, um, some sort of conduit between them, whether it's cities connected by highways, websites connected by hyperlinks, atoms connected by molecular bonds, etc. These, uh, these are all objects that can be abstracted to graphs. And graphs are sort of a, a way of manipulating or thinking about these networks in a way that we can do some mathematical analysis to them. Come up very often in computer systems, obviously, whenever you've got computers linked in a network. Anytime you've got, um, uh, that's the hardware side, anytime you've got uh, links between, as I said, websites, uh, you're talking about, uh, you're talking about a, a graph. Anytime you've got a social network and so forth. So we're going to look uh, at the ways in which the graphs are connected now. Now that we've had a chance to talk about what a graph is, some basic properties, some basic examples of graphs, today in section 10.2 we'll talk about some various ways that you can connect the vertices in a graph. Remember the vertices are these objects, these dots, they're represented by dots sort of graphically, um, and the edges are the, the line segments that connect them. So we are going to talk about uh, walks, trails, paths, circuits. These are all ways of interconnecting the vertices in the graph. And like I did in section 10.1, I'm not going to emphasize, I'm not going to write a lot of words. You can read those words in your textbook. What's more important to me are the, uh, the pictures. I'm going to make use of this graph. So I finally learned to do a little prep work on the whiteboard before I started the video, so I'm not taking the time to draw this. So to start with, a walk. These are all going to be ways of getting from one vertex to another. So a walk is a succession of, edited, of vertices and edges. And the only, uh, the only um, restriction we're going to place on these is you can't kind of jump from one vertex to another. You're going to take a vertex and go out on one of the edges adjacent to that vertex and then you'll go to another vertex, and you'll go out on one of the other edges instant that vertex, and so forth. Just kind of proceeding from some initial vertex through some first edge to a second vertex, V1, out some other edge, and so forth, ending with some vertex Vn. And the only restriction is where each Ei has endpoints v i minus one and v i. If you look at the way I've indexed this, all this is saying is that e one, for instance, has to have endpoints v zero and v one. So e one really is an edge that connects v zero and v one. E two has to have endpoints v v one and v two. So e two really is an edge going from v one. Oops. <laughs> to V2, and so forth. So you can't just jump from one vertex to another unless there's an edge between them. That's all a walk is. So there are many such walks, for instance, on this graph I've drawn here. If we wanted to start at V4, one way would be to go from V4 to e, through E5 to V6, through E7 to V5, and then if we want to, we can go back to V4 along E6, and then we can keep going, maybe take E3 down to V3. As long as we're not jumping over from one vertex to another without an edge to follow, 
We're a walk. There's no restrictions. They're so unrestricted that sometimes they're not really useful. If you are traversing a network, you might not want to walk because sometimes there's redundance or there's repetition that you don't want. So what you might want to do is look at a trail. A trail is a walk without repeated edges. So now we're, we're, we're narrowing our scope a little bit. Um, the uh, walk that I just included here, uh, let me just repeat here, this would be one, two, three, four. Those would be the steps I take starting with that vertex there as my starting point, V4. Starting from V4 and following that succession there, that was a walk, and it's also a trail. However, if I decided, since this wasn't a directed graph, remember directed graphs have a certain direction that you can only go on that edge. This isn't a directed graph, so what I could do is I could go back along E3 again to my initial vertex V4, and the result would no longer be a trail. So as soon as I repeat an edge, I am not a trail, but I'm still a walk. I'm going to keep track down here. Walk has no restrictions. Inside of the collection of all walks, we've got the collection of all trails. So this is like a Venn diagram illustrating the various ways of connecting vertices to one another. The set of all trails is inside of the set of all walks, because a trail is a walk. But not necessarily the other way around, we just saw an example. A little more restrictive still is a path. A path is a walk without repeated vertices. So if you tell me that you can't repeat vertices, you're restricting yourself even more. Let's go back to our initial um, example here, starting at V4, following E3, E7, E6. As soon as we get back to V4, we are no longer a path. Even without going down to V3 and then back again, which eliminated our a trail, we can't even go back to V4 because as soon as we do that, we have repeated the vertex V4 in our walk. So um, that walk, starting with the initial vertex going down and around again, ending up back at V4, is not a path. It is a trail, but it's not a path because we repeated vertices. Now one thing you should think about, convince yourself that this is true, is that every path is indeed a trail, but not necessarily the other way around. So, for instance, we saw the trail, um, we saw the trail, boom, 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 that was still a trail, going E5, E7, E6, E3 was still a trail, as long as we didn't repeat that edge E3, but it's not a path because we came back to that vertex V4. So there are trails that are not paths, but every path is a trail. Why is that? Because if you have a path, you're not repeating vertices. So you're certainly not repeating edges. One way to think about this is a uh, contrapositive. If you do repeat an edge, you're repeating at least one of its endpoints. And therefore, if you repeat an edge, you are definitely repeating a vertex. And therefore, if you are not a trail, then you are not a path. So again, not a trail implies not a path, and the contrapositive of that is if you're a path, you're a trail. So the fact that every uh, path is a trail, and they're both obviously, obviously walks, can be proven by contrapositive. Can be proven by contraposition, as I just said. I went through that rather quickly, but make sure you pause the video and think about that. Um, the claim that every path is a trail is the same as saying, well, if you're a path, you're a trail. The contrapositive of that is, if you're not a trail, then you're not a path. If you're not a trail, it means you repeated an edge, which means you had to have repeated at least one of its endpoints, which means you're not a path. So make sure that you've got this down before you go any further. I'm not even going to write these down. 
Um, a closed walk is a walk that begins and ends at the same place. So the um, the initial uh, the initial path that I followed there. The initial, oof, I shouldn't say path. It's really easy to say things non-technically here. The initial walk that I followed, starting with V4, going to V6, to V5, back to V4, that would be a closed walk because it begins and ends at the same place. Uh, a circuit is a closed, I am going to write this down because this is important. A circuit is a closed, not just a walk, but a closed trail with at least one edge. Now you might ask yourself to begin with, how can you possibly have a trail with one edge? Um, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, how could you, uh, well I guess you could, how could you have a closed trail with one edge is the question. How can you begin and end at the same vertex and have at least one edge? And I just kind of did it in the air right there. Remember we can have self loops, we can have uh, an edge that begins and ends at the same vertex. That's a way to have a closed trail, beginning and ending at one vertex, not repeating an edge. Right? You're not repeating an edge if you follow a self loop. You are repeating a vertex, which is why we can't have a closed path. But we can have a closed trail. So we can begin and end at the same vertex without repeating edges. An example, let me draw an example here. I'm going to switch colors. An example in this graph would be if I started here and I went one, two, three, four, five. Now I've repeated the edge V4, or the vertex rather, V4, as soon as I get back to V4, six, seven steps. What I just did there was a trail. I didn't repeat any edges. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven edges without repeating. Going back to V1, so I began and ended at the same place. So we have a closed trail with at least one edge. That would be a circuit in this graph. Again, it's not a path. In fact, you can't have a closed path because you're requiring beginning and ending at the same vertex, vertex, which means you are repeating that vertex. So you can't have that happen. You can't have a closed path, but you can have a closed trail with at least one edge, which gives you a circuit. So make sure you pause the video and think about that for a moment, how this, what I just illustrated in this graph, really is a, a circuit, a closed trail, not repeating an edge, with at least one, uh, with at least one edge in it. You might ask yourself, well, what's this, uh, um, blah, 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 what was I going to say here? So, so how could you, why is this a distinction? Um, why, do you, why do you distinguish a closed trail? Why do you want to not uh, repeat edges? Well, you could think about the following, uh, you could think about the following a walk, for instance. So a closed walk would be one in which I start with V1, boom, 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 boom. And then maybe just for fun, I go back and forth between V4 and V5 for a while. So I end up here, boom, 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 boom. That would be a walk. And then eventually you could end up at V1 again and make a closed walk. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of repetition in there. So much so that I'm starting to blur this edge because I've gone over it so many times now. So. Ideally, you want a trail instead of a walk because you, you want the most efficient route possible. As soon as you use an edge, if you're going back and forth over it, there's really no need to include it again. You can always cut out that repetition and make a, a, a more efficient traversal of the graph uh, by making a trail instead of a walk. So generally speaking, with a, in a circuit, you want to talk about uh, a closed trail rather than a, um, rather than a closed walk more generally. So a, uh, I'm just going to mention a simple circuit is one in which the only repetition of vertices is the first and the last one. What I just drew would not be a simple circuit because of that guy V4 in the middle. So a simple circuit is one where the initial vertex, where you begin your circuit, is the only repeated vertex. And again, in this, uh, this circuit that I drew up here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, edges long, would not be a simple circuit because we're forced to go through this vertex V4 again. In fact, there is no simple circuit that traverses the, the bottom part of this graph. Notice I haven't even talked about V7 yet. We'll get to that in a little while here. 
Um, so all of this is, um, I'm going to keep this picture up or maybe, uh, yeah, I'll keep that picture up. I'm going to make a little room here. All of this is getting at, is sort of hinting at the connections between vertices. These are all ways to connect uh, vertices in a graph. And, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> again, not COVID, just got this lovely clean fluid in my lungs again. So if I start to add loopy in the next 10 minutes, you'll know why. So this sort of begs the, the definition of, um, this sort of begs another definition for graphs, and that is the idea of a connected graph. Because if we have, uh, remember we talked about in section 10.1, if we have vertices that are kind of off on their own, living uh, way out in the middle of space. Sorry, I'm getting really close to the camera here, giving you a lovely view of uh, the scuba divers and sharks and octopi on my shirt. Um, if you've got a, uh, a graph with a vertex living off on its own somewhere, or multiple vertices living off on their own over here, you can't get to them. There are no edges, so therefore there are no walks that connect these vertices with that, one, that, that little piece over there. That would be an example of a graph that is not connected. So a graph is connected. This is a definition of what it means to be connected. A graph is connected if uh, there exists a walk between any two vertices. And generally speaking, from the picture, you can tell a if a graph is connected. Does it look like it's one piece where the edges will allow you to uh, get from any one vertex to any other? Now, <coughs> the definition of a, of a connected graph is one in which there's a walk between any two vertices. But we can always replace this. And there's a lemma in your textbook. I don't recall the number for it. But there's a lemma in this section, 10.2, of your textbook that talks about um, a graph being connected if and only if there exists a path between any two distinct vertices. And that's a distinction here between the definition, let me just emphasize that this is the definition of the word connected. And this is a lemma, a result uh, regarding that definition. So we say we're connected if and only if we, we are connected if there's a walk between two vertices. But what the lemma says is you can replace the word walk with path. Remember the distinction here. A path repeats no vertices. It is more efficient somehow than a walk. And that sort of gives you a cue as to how you might prove this lemma. Essentially, I'm not going to go through a formal proof, and your textbook does have that formal proof, but essentially what happens, let's say, for instance, that I want to, let's see, I don't want to do this. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead and consider this picture, this graph, it's just to give you the idea as to what you would do. If I want to connect these two vertices to each other, the two circled vertices, I can follow a path, or a walk rather, that goes one, two, uh, three, four, five. Um, so let me just number those edges so you know the order that I'm traversing them would be a simple way, again, not simple, simple is a technical term. It's an easy way, it's an easy way to get from this vertex U to this vertex V following a walk. We're clearly connected, we can clearly get from any vertex to any and the other by some walk, but what we want to do is convince ourselves that you, you don't have to use a walk, you could always use a path. And the idea is the following. If you start at U, and you go, and you go, and you go, and you, uh-oh, I just repeated a vertex in my walk. I went one, two, three, 
four and I'm back at the vertex I started the third edge with. Essentially, as soon as you repeat that vertex, you know that anything you did in between going to that vertex, leaving it and coming back can be omitted. Because somehow we managed to go from that vertex, we did a bunch of stuff, it just so happens we only visited one other vertex, but it doesn't really matter. We could have gone off and done all kinds of stuff over here. As soon as we get back to that vertex, we know we can just eliminate that from our walk because it's unnecessary. So going here, here, and here, and doing all sorts of stuff, coming back, as soon as we come back to that vertex, we know everything we did in between is unnecessary. So we could go simply one, two, omit all this, three, and go straight to our vertex over here. That's not a formal proof, but it gives you the intuition as to how you would begin to prove that you can always replace a walk with a path. That's one simplification. Um, in general, you always want to go with um, you always want to go with the simplest possible path, and a path is simpler in general than a walk is. Now, what if your graph isn't connected? So these are pictures that illustrate connected graphs, but I did have one up here a moment ago. What if we just append this to this graph here? We would have another object in the graph. Maybe we have another piece of the graph over here with a self-loop in it. We could have different pieces in the graph. These turn out to be called the connected components. And this is a term that stems from a different field of mathematics called topology. But these are called the connected components of the graph. The individual pieces, each one of which is connected, but they are not connected to each other. So a connected graph has one single connected component. That's another way of talking about a connected graph. In general, a graph may have many connected components. In fact, sometimes mathematicians, not so often in computer science, but mathematicians will talk about um, infinite graphs, where you could have infinitely many connected components. Um, or you could have a single connected component uh, that has infinitely many vertices in it. So just a couple of I ideas we want to talk about. Uh, very often, you want to, uh, there's a famous problem, for instance, called the traveling salesman problem, where the per you, you want to model the travel of a salesperson that starts in one place, uh, goes along a route that uh, visits certain stops, and perhaps certain stores or certain uh, vendors that they need to visit, and, and ends up back where they started in the most efficient way possible. This is typically a weighted graph that has some cost associated to following each particular path. You want to minimize the cost of the travel. Again, the traveling salesperson problem effectively is one where you want to start at a particular spot and traverse every single vertex, visit every single vertex in a particular graph, ending up where you started in the most efficient manner possible. So essentially, that's a graph theory problem where you're given a graph, you're given a vertex to start and end at, and you want to visit every other vertex in between. So this gives rise to the idea of what's called an Eulerian circuit. That's named after Euler. Leonard Euler was a mathematician of the 18th, 19th centuries, one of the most prolific mathematicians of all time. Please do not pronounce this Euler. Do not pronounce this Euler. It's pronounced Euler. Euler who was the founder of what we now know as graph theory uh, with the Königsberg Bridge problem, really cool problem, look it up, uh, uh, has named after him an idea of an Eulerian circuit. Now remember, a circuit is just a closed trail that has at least one edge in it. An Eulerian circuit is a circuit or a closed trail, just to remind you, it is a closed trail that visits every vertex in a graph. So is it possible um, um, is it possible to visit every vertex in a graph? It turns out if it is, it visits every vertex in a graph um, exactly once. Or at least once. Sorry. At least once. And it turns out, as a consequence, if you have an Eulerian circuit, it will visit every edge exactly once. You may have to, because it's a trail and not a path. Remember, a circuit is a closed trail, not a closed path, because, of course, you're going to end and begin at the same vertex. Um, because it's a trail and not a path, you will, in fact, repeat vertices, and you're allowed to do that. You can visit each vertex at least once. 
but you want to visit every edge exactly once. And that'll be a consequence of visiting every vertex at least once, as long as you are a closed trail. So this every edge exactly once is really a consequence of visiting every vertex. You don't have to say that. So some people will just define an Eulerian circuit to be a closed trail visiting every vertex at least once, because this, this last part is actually a consequence of the first part. So it turns out that there is a condition that tells you whether or not you have a, uh, an Eulerian circuit. And that condition is that every vertex in the graph has even positive degree. Um, so I don't want to turn the, you'll see why I don't want to turn the board around. Um, but I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, get rid of this lemma to make room to draw what I just said. So what did I just say? I said, we'll call it a theorem. A graph has an Eulerian circuit. If and only if every vertex has positive even degree. So this is a really easy way to tell if a graph has an Eulerian circuit or not. And it doesn't tell you what the Eulerian circuit is. You might have to do a little more uh, poking around, a little more work to find the circuit, but it will tell you whether one exists or not. And that's pretty cool. Going back to the traveling salesperson problem again, you want to know, is there a way to begin and end at the same vertex, traveling and hitting every vertex in your graph exactly once? And that question boils down to looking at the degrees. It turns out, I'm not going to prove this. There is a proof in your textbook. I'm not, I'm not going to prove this. But it turns out all you have to do is look at the degrees of all the vertices. If every single degree is positive and even, yes, you've got an Eulerian circuit. Again, you don't know where it is necessarily. You might have to look for it, but one exists. I mentioned the Königsberg Bridge problem a moment ago, and that turns out to be the first problem that Euler couched in terms of graph theory. He, uh, in his native Königsberg, um, or he that wasn't where he was born, but he lived there for some time, uh, he, uh, he, there were a, a set of bridges that connected the land masses that made up the city, and he was musing as he was walking one day, is there a way for me to begin here and end here, walking over each bridge and visiting each of the land masses that make up this town of Königsberg exactly once? And he abstracted the problem, drawing the little land masses as his vertices and the bridges as edges connecting them. And he found out that there was no, for Königsberg, there was no such circuit because one of the land masses had odd degree to it um, when you abstracted it as a graph. So for instance, this initial graph we looked at, it's been drawn over so many times that, it's, uh, uh, that, it's, that some of it's hard to see now. We can tell that, we can tell whether or not this has an Eulerian circuit. This vertex has degree two, one, two edges coming out of it. This vertex has degree two as well. This one has degree two. This one is a little more busy. It has degree four sitting there sort of at the middle of the graph. This one also has degree two. So far, so good. This one has degree... Oh no, this one has degree three. This one has degree one. It turns out that the degrees, uh, remember that, that, that theorem from section 10.1, the sum of the degrees of the vertices in the graph is two times the number of edges. So you're always gonna have an even total number for your degree because it's two times something. But we had an imbalance here. Here was an odd degree, here's another odd degree. If you have one odd degree, you're gonna have at least one other odd degree to balance it out somewhere. Otherwise, your sum wouldn't be even. So it turns out there are two vertices with positive odd degree in this graph. So there is, by this theorem, there is no Eulerian circuit. If we modify the graph a little bit, what if we added, let's say, E9, E10, and an extra vertex V8 here? Let's add that extra vertex. That bumps the degree for this guy up to four, this one up to two, and the new vertex has degree two, so every vertex now has even positive degree, and there would be an Eulerian circuit here. In fact, it's not too hard to see. If we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, boom, we're done. So we can go along the top of the graph and then kind of go back along the bottom. This was a really simple example and made it uh, intentionally easy. However, four, your quiz. Ta-da! 
This is why I didn't want to turn it around to begin with. This is quiz CE11. So the COVID era 11 quiz dealing with what we just had on the other side. So what I want you to determine for this particular graph, I hope those numbers are legible. Please let me know if they're not. Here's the question. Is there an Eulerian circuit in this graph? And why or why not? So answer those two quick questions for, uh, for quiz number 11. Is there an Eulerian circuit in this graph and why or why not? And we've got one more section. I'm going to do one more video. And I may have time to record it right now. I may not. So I'm not sure if you'll see me in the same shirt in the next video. But um, I will look forward to seeing you then. If you have any questions on this stuff, please shoot me an email. Uh, meet, set, schedule a time to meet with me on Google Hangouts or kind of my office hours, Monday, Wednesday, 9 to 10. And I will see you soon. Thank you so much for your continued efforts.